<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to our Friday afternoon, hopefully excuse to get us up and moving and, and a little bit uh, into um, embodying restoration acting and whatnot for a bit of a, a bit of a change of pace. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of my colleagues, um, Bill Kerr, who is an associate professor in the Department of English Theater, Film and Media uh, with me at the University of Manitoba. He's directed, acted and dramaturged throughout Western Canada and has a longstanding interest in the teaching and practical application of acting theory and style generally and particularly in the restoration, luckily for us. And so he will be leading us through um, a number of things today. <laughs> so without further ado, I want to welcome you all and welcome Bill and hand over the, the floor. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome. And I want you all to uh, please indulge me as I try something out here, uh, it's particularly in this forum. Uh, I've been trying to teach acting out for about a year online and it's, it's always fun and challenging. And what I'm going to invite you all to do is to sort of join me in practicing gestures and postures, the sort of physical signifiers of the restoration, uh, of the restoration actor, and sort of in order to investigate the sort of lived text and practice with the notion that we can understand more um, how the text is put together by examining that text and gesture are, um, are, are completely interweaved. Uh, um, but also how that we can, we can, we can through practice, uh, share a certain joy as well, if I can put it that way. Um, so uh, I hope that's all right. Uh, I hope you're all game uh, uh, for doing that. And also know that this is an experiment, so I'm not sure how it'll go. So I look forward to your feedback as we go. Uh, ideally, we'll have some time for questions at the end, but also um, I'm going to be asking for your feedback throughout. So at any point you want to sort of, uh, if you have a question you want to ask then, I mean, let's ask it then too. I'm not worried about you know, being derailed or anything uh, like that. Uh, I'm also hoping that this will be a fun change from a regular session, particularly at the end of a Friday. Uh, so uh, that's my goal. If I can accomplish that, I will be, I will be happy. Um, but also just to say that this uh, thinking through gesture has always helped me uh, think about how restoration comedy uh, works, also how to explore it from a different angle, and really how to teach it. I find it generally engages students um, um, when we engage their physical selves. Uh, because sometimes the language feels so far away, uh, even though the language itself is a physical joy, uh, just to say as well. So there is some some, some joy in that too. Uh, so paste it in the chat, uh, theoretically, uh, tell me if it's there or not. Um, I did paste it there. Uh, is a link to the Project Gutenberg text of the way of the world. Um, just you might well hand that, have it handy in another forum too, that's fine. Um, it's just so we can refer to the, uh, the marriage negotiation wooing scene from Act uh, or scene five is about two thirds of the way down the PDF uh, here. Uh, and I'll give you a moment to find that. In Gutenberg, it's listed as act four, scene five, uh, whereas in a regular text, it would be listed as act, part of act four, scene one. But the Gutenberg is organized by French scenes. So, so that's what it is. So I'm just gonna wait for a second just to make sure that, uh, that everybody's found that. We won't use it right away, but we will be using that throughout. Or if you wanna grab a text, if you happen to have one, that's just as easy. All right, so I'm just going to give it another couple minutes and then, uh, or a minute or so, then we'll get, we'll continue. Um, th the next thing I'll suggest while you're doing that, or if you're done that, is it's also going to require a willingness to, to physically do it, which means you're going to need room, if possible, to stand up. Um, so I am, uh, oh, uh, sorry, yes, I can put the chat in the chat, the act and scene. Um, uh, it's... Uh, In the Gutenberg version, as I said, it's uh, scene five. Uh, and then uh, the Oh, Bill, I didn't, we just have a little hard time. Your audio cut out there for a second. Oh, sorry. Oh, now uh, you're back. Perfect. I'm back. All right. <laughs> good, good old Zoom. Uh, always a joy. Um, it begins with the, like Daphne, she as lovely and as coy, 
and it's the moment when Millamount and Mirabelle are alone on stage. Which is why I say in this, in the Gutenberg version, it's a scene five, just because in French scenes, we have a new scene every time somebody leaves or, or, or somebody comes on stage. Um, whereas in most modern texts of the play, when it's put in the five act structure, it'll just simply be a part of act four, scene one. Um, so that's why the different ways to find it. Uh, okay. And, uh, we'll be looking at the scene a little later down and I'll, I'll get to that at that point. But as I said, if you can, um, if you can, if you're physically able to give yourself some space to uh, stand up, that doesn't mean you have to stand up now, uh, though actually it, it will be, I think I want to start with standing. Uh, so I want to show, first of all, um, I have put on a shirt today, uh, which is the most colorful one I have, which also allows me cuffs so I can sort of twirl them. Um, also, if I go back far enough, I'm not quite sure if I can here. Uh, you can, you know, we can. I've also got tights on, but I guess that won't matter. Uh, uh, yeah, taking earbuds out is probably a good idea. So I'm just going to put it up there uh, a little bit so it's easier to see me. So let me know if it's not. Um, but I thought we'd start with bowing. Um, now, you don't have to be visual. You don't have to be, if you want, if you don't want to be seen, that's fine. You can turn off your camera. I'll keep mine on. But I just thought we start with the act of bowing and what it connotates, right? So we'll just start with bowing as we might today. So if we bow today, we probably have our, our legs side by side. We bow something like this. So just go ahead and do that and just figure out what is that. So just feel it. Feel it what, it, what it feels like. And I will ask you throughout this, by the way, um, I'll ask you to unmute as we go, just and to tell us how it feels to do these bows. So I have the first flourish of what a restoration bow has. Um, so the first flourish of a restoration bow, of course, is that it involves not just the head, but also the hand. So if, if you could take your hand and do a quick circle and present like that. So down and present. So as we bow, and know what happens with the other hand, it gets lifted up. So we bow like that. Just a nice shallow one for now. And what does it feel like to do that as opposed to, did anybody want to share what that, what that connotates for you or visually or what it feels like? I feel fancy. Yeah, it feels much more fancy yeah. immediately, right? And, so, and dramatic, yes, exactly. So now if we do a deeper one of the same bow, Ooh, so good. same thing, but all the way to the waist, and what does that feel like? Like I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good hamstring stretch. <laughs> well, so we have those other things. I'm just going to add another thing too, and that has to do with where our legs are. So in a typical restoration bow, they wouldn't have our, the legs side by side, but we'd be in sort of third ballet position. So what that is, is your, your front, your right foot is pointing straight forward and your left foot is perpendicular to your right foot with the heels almost touching, but the heel of your left foot about an inch away from your right foot and your left knee slightly bent. Do you feel that? Okay, so I'm just gonna back, everybody got that? Now then, now try that same bow with the knees like that. And it begins to feel, doesn't it, ever more elaborate and fancy. And so that we, as we feel these things, what are we saying with them too? to the person we're engaging with. I'm gonna add the final one, uh, which, is the, is the, which is the grand one for the male in, in the restoration tragedy, which is now keep your legs in that same relative position, but put your right leg in ahead. Now, put about a, about a foot forward. And now what you're gonna do, keeping the left leg bent, is we bow, but at the end of the bow, we point at our shin. And our fingers, the tips of our fingers actually touch our shin. So if I go back far enough, the hand can be either up here, held, or behind your back, like that. Uh, so, uh, how does that one feel? <laughs> Anyone want to share? Good, <laughs> excellent, yeah. And there's, two, there's a couple things about that bow. There's an interesting uh, different quality. If you keep your head down like this, then it's, an, it's a bow of real deference, right? It's a real deferent bow to the other and most ostentatious, absolutely. But if you put your head up at the end, it's like, what do you think of me? And particularly, it's what do you think of me? Because what the male is doing, what the rake is doing with that bow is saying, don't I have a damn fine leg? Have a good look at, look at my leg and have a good look at the color of my, of my stocking and also the, the wealth of my fabric. And so what we want to think of there, there's a kind of presentational nature, a kind of inviting of the gaze and an inviting of judgment, which is directed by the flourish of the bow and the pointing to that wonderful 
uh, fabric that you're wearing. Okay, <laughs> so that's our first bit. I just wanted to get started. Uh, with a bit is, of is this like a normal bow or then like a foppish bow would be even more exaggerated? Yeah, that's a great question. It actually, it, it's, 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 quite a, it's quite a normal bow depending on what you want to do, right? So what I mean is what you want to do. And what we're going to do, so if we take um, uh, just, a, you know, a few words then. So at the beginning of the negotiation from, from uh, Mirabelle's point of view, so this is about halfway... Um, uh, down the speech, and this is before his items. She's given her demands, um, and he then says, I thank you. In premise, then, I covenant that your acquaintance be general and you admit no sworn confident or intimate of your own sex. Do you see that? Um, give you a moment to find that. So what I want you to do now is think about what happens if, and go ahead and do it if you like, if you say, for example, with a nice shallow bow, thank you, in premise, then, and what is the difference between doing that? Go ahead and try that to see what it feels like. In, thank you. In premise, then. Now go ahead and try it with the deeper bow. Thank you. In premise, then. And finally, the one all the way to your leg. Thank you. In premise, then. So what, and let me ask you both, what does it feel like as an actor, but also what is it, Con connote to you as an audience member, or what do you feel about it, depending on the different bow? Keep mind I, think the, I think the shallower bow would feel like a little bit sharper or less sincere, like thanks, but it would depend on how it was um, enunciated. And I think the lowest, fanciest bow could be the most sincere. But I, maybe that's just my perspective. But that could also be sarcastic to me if it's like performed in such a way that it is supposed to be like exaggerated. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. That all of these can be be turned on to mean the opposite of what you know. So at the same time as we say, well, it means this, but also it could be the exact opposite of this. Um, but I do think it has to do with the amount of deference in it, right? So usually with a little bow, you're giving very little power to the other, whereas with that big bow, you're sort of Su suggesting a kind of humility, um, which could as well be a negotiating tactic rather than an honest uh, thing. And part of the issue here is the wonderful um, quality of restoration comedy is what you get to do with that style. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that you do have to use it. <laughs> and I think sometimes when we read it on the page, we forget the, what, the, what that expression and how, how your expression accompanies your words and, and the effect that can have on an audience. Um, and also the comic... Uh, you know, the, the comic potential uh, in, in those uses. So that's sort of just what I'm getting at it as a general thing. So I just thought we'd start that way. And I hope that, uh, yeah, Katie? Would you would you expect somebody to bow on stage anytime somebody says thank you in script? It, 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 no, not necessarily. I mean, I, yeah, if it's like clearly not a sincere thank you, but like, if, for example, the, the Gutenberg doesn't have stage directions there to indicate that Mirabelle is bowing. No, in fact, it, what we is typical of texts of the period is they almost never have stage directions. Mm -hmm. And so what that ends up doing for us a lot of the time is that we don't think about the physicalization of the text. And we just see it as, as, as a series of words. And we marvel at the complexity and the sort of joy of the oratorical polish of those words. But we forget that they're accompanied by a, a particular stylistic kind of understanding and pattern. So the, the, the point there is not that we know, but that the, the actor has the option. We would expect a kind of bow uh, in greeting. So we would expect it at the beginning of a scene. But that's where we would almost certainly expect it, that there would be some sort of bow for when you first encounter someone else. Um, but then of course, not with a servant. <laughs> so it would be, you know, depending on whom you're encountering. Uh, so, so that's where we'd expect it, but it doesn't mean you can't do it at other places. The reason I would suggest a bow might be an interesting thing to say here is it's the beginning of his negotiating um, stance. So there's a way of sort of, when we think about how these scenes work, it's a way of kind of breaking it up. It, it suggests, now I shall begin. And the way in which he launches into it, that's why a bow might be a good choice um, at this particular point. And later we'll look at, at flourishes where we use the cuff or we use a handkerchief. Uh, without a bow, because that's the other another classic sort of masculine gesture in uh, the Restoration. Uh, whereas, as I said, I, I think I, I can't remember if I should have said it, but for a, for a woman, the fan is is such a, a particularly powerful uh, tool 
um, in, in the restoration gesture pattern. So we'll look at the fan as well. Uh, good. I just thought we'd get get started. I'm just <laughs> I realize now with the door, I it looks very tiny. So I'm just going to put this back down for a bit so I don't look quite so tiny the whole time. Um, and I'm going to sort of now step back uh, to, to think about um, uh, a, a little bit what's behind these gestural choices. Uh, yeah, and I wish, and see, this is the thing, if we could do it in person, I'd have fans for all of you, right? And it would be so much fun. Uh, so I'm going to start, actually, um, to get us to think back to, to sort of what acting is like in a period. I'm going to go back to the most sort of famous piece of acting advice we have um, from... Uh, not the period, but just before, which is Hamlet's advice to the players. You know, speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you know that, as many of your players do, I had as light leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Or do not saw the air too much with your hands thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Um, so I'll maybe stop there and I'll switch quickly to the end. I won't do, do, do all of it, but then go to um, uh, be not too tame, neither. Um, sorry, just have, I've suddenly forgotten it, so I just have to call it up here. Uh, where do I have it? There we go. Uh, be not too tame, neither. Let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit your action to the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you overstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature. And so I want us to think about, you know, what, what, is being suggested by these words. I mean, first of all, it's practical uh, in that we know that uh, Shakespeare couldn't give the whole script to his actors because they would just take it down the road and sell it to the next company because uh, there's no such thing as copyright. So actors only get their sides. And at the first rehearsal, the playwright reads the play to them. So they literally listen to the playwright pronounce it and they find the vocal patterns, the inflection, the iambic pentameter, and they listen and they echo it. And they don't know how to do this. They're trained to do this. And secondly, um, secondly, we know um, that there's a sort of uh, demand of repertory, and that is to say, if you have to do 40 plays in, in any one season, as we sometimes had with the King's Man had a repertory of up to 40, then you have to be able to switch very quickly play to play. So you have to be able to hang your hat uh, on something other than a kind of naturalism in acting. And that thing is one, the text, uh, and two, um, what I'm going to call oratorical history, or the understanding of gestural pattern, or suiting the action to the word, the word to the action, and choosing the appropriate one, and communicating uh, in that way. Um, you know, we have in that period John Bowers, if you haven't seen his Chirologia and Chironomia, uh, do people know? Uh, it's great to look at just to see the charts of this hand gesture means this, 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 these are this, and this explains, and how, and this is, and this is, and so that as we, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to beseech, I beseech you, your hands must be like this, if your hands aren't like this, uh, yes, I will take that, yeah, I'll put those names in the chat later, thanks, thanks, Kate, for sure, but Chirologia and, Chir and Chironomia are literally, Chirologia is the movement of the hands, the patterns it creates, and Chironomia is the use of that in, rhetor in rhetoric, so it's sort of distilled. So one saying it's, this is the natural way people use their hands, observed and scientifically categorized. This is the way we take that scientific knowledge and use it in rhetoric. Um, and, we, and we also know this oratorical history, which goes back to Quintilian in Rome and has had a continuing influence on speech making, uh, has that notion of balance. You gotta be full of passion, but it must be controlled. Uh, each gesture must be just so and no more and no less. And so this, um, call for balance uh, continues uh, in the restoration stage. So, um, but it also raises the question, what the hell does natural mean? What is the modesty of nature? It's a fascinating phrase. It's not just natural, don't be, it's be natural, but be modestly natural. Um, so, so what does that mean? What does that mean for the, you know, the plays of the period we're now talking about? Um, so I'm now gonna, and, and I'll type these in later too. Um, I'm gonna look now at some specific texts of acting advice from the period. Uh, and what I'm about to quote comes from um, Bet, uh, uh, an article or a book called The History of the English Stage, written by Thomas Betterton, 
who's the great actor of the Restoration. However, it wasn't actually written by him. It was written by either the publisher Edmund Curl or by William Oldys, but he has such cachet that they used his name as an author, even though, which is a great sort of restoration thing, right? Putting a facade uh, on the very text itself. Um, and that mystique of attributing to Betterton is particularly interesting as we think about it, because Betterton uh, throughout the period is acclaimed as the best, the most appropriate, the most natural Hamlet, all at the age of 70. So how can, from our point of view, we've overstepped the modesty of nature uh, and having a 70 year old play uh, play Hamlet. It seems bizarre to us. Um, so we want to ask what it what it meant to them. And so I'm, I'm just using this, you know, uh, these are from uh, Nagler's source book of theatrical history. Um, uh, you may well be familiar with it. There's a, a number of these texts that have these, uh, that just compile uh, original sources uh, so that you're, you're rather than you know, using the theory of today, we're using the theory of the time. Oh, uh, thanks, Diana. Uh, that's very, very nice of you to, uh, to put that in for us. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to read a passage about eyebrows to begin with, because I think it's important to note that they think indeed, how do you use your eyebrows? And particularly, I will describe it. Your eyebrows must neither be immovable nor always in motion. Nor must they both be raised on everything that is spoken with eagerness and consent, and much less must one be raised and the other cast down. <laughs> uh, so Katie just was saying, if the collection is um, uh, sources of theatrical history, a source book in theatrical history um, by uh, A.M. Nagler. Um, okay, so where was I there? Sorry. Uh, cast down, that is raised and the other cast down. So um, I'm obviously, uh, uh, um, you know, no Vulcan acting in, in the, uh, the restoration. But generally they must remain in the same posture and equality, which they have by nature, allowing them due motion when the passions require it. That is, to contract themselves and frown in sorrow, to um, smooth and dilate themselves in joy, and to hang down in humility, etc. So all of these are considered even to the, well, I use the eyebrow because I think it's particularly fascinating that they bothered to spend any time on eyebrows at all. Uh, that they even considered the motion of the eyebrow to me is, is quite fascinating. Um, or it says uh, about the mouth, the mouth must neither be rods nor the lips bit or licked, which are all ungenteel and unmannerly actions. And yet some, what some are frequently guilty of. Yet in some efforts or starts of passion, the lips have their share of action, but this more on the stage. And so again, that's sort of that we can be passionate with the lips, but we have to be careful. You can't do too much. And I finally I want to go now to the hands, and this is where I'm going to get you all to get engaged again. Um, we come out of the hands, which as they are the chief instruments of action, bearing in themselves as many ways as they are capable of expressing things. So is it, it is a difficult matter to give such rules as are without exception. Those natural significations of particular gestures and what I shall here add will, I hope, be some light to the young actor in this particular. First, I would have him regard the action of the hands as to their expression of accusation, deprecation, threats, desire, and etc. And to weigh well what these actions are and in what manner expressed, and then considering how large a share those actions have in all manner of discourse, he will find that his hands need never be idle or employed in an insignificant or unbeautiful gesture. Uh, so I like that, that sort of notion that they're always employed in the Restoration, um, which is actually not, not true of our, our contemporary acting, which you know, one of the, the first things we say to most young actors is, put your hands in neutral possession, hanging down by your sides, so they don't get in the way. So they're not expressing something you don't mean to express. But in the Restoration, putting your hands down by your side would be like an admission of defeat. Uh, you're, you're incapable of knowing what to do uh, with your hands. So this is what I'm going to get us all to do again, and this is, uh, uh, him describing Hamlet in the scene between him and his mother on the appearance of the ghost. And so the line here, I'm just going to put this back up, um, is save me and hover over me with wings you heavenly guards. So uh, according to, uh, to Betterton, uh, this is spoke with arms and hands extended. So just extend, there it is, extend fully, arms and hands extended. And, and, and what that feels like, and expressing his concern as well as his, as his eyes and whole face. So extend it, and you're allowed here to engage everything, right? And think about what that feels like, right? That, I know that connotes immediately. So this, uh, and you can, you can feel it in your bones, can't you? So let me just stop for a second and ask, what does it feel like to do that? 
Anybody? Nothing? Is it? Part of what I'm trying to get at is, is in naturalistic acting, we have that, or at least early sort of strange, yeah. in naturalistic acting, we have this early um, uh, desire by sort of what becomes the method acting in American theater to feel things inside and then express them outside. But there's a difference here in the restoration. We express on the surface, and that tends to give us the feeling inside, uh, as it, of course, much more clearly gives to the audience as well. So if I'm doing that, the audience understands what that gesture is very clearly. Um, he carries on to say, if an action uh, comes to be used by only one hand, that must be the right, it being indecent to make a gesture with the left alone. Um, Except you should say any such thing as, rather than be guilty of so foul a deed, I cut this right hand off, and etc. So if we do that one instead, so if we start here and think, and we retreat and take our, our right hand back because we go rather than so far, I'd rather cut my right hand off. And we now are looking outwards and we have that different feeling. And then as he says, uh, for here the actions must be expressed by the left hand because the right is the member to suffer. When you speak of yourself, the right not the left hand, must be applied to the bosom, declaring your own faculties and passions, your heart, your soul, or your conscience. But this action, generally speaking, should be only applied or expressed by laying the hand gently on the breast and not by thumping it, as some people do. So if we start like this, and then and hold our hand on our breast, the change in feeling immediately comes about even in the change in how we hold our hands. I hope that... So anything that anybody want to uh, just quickly chat about at all before we move on to the next? Um, might as well stay up because we're going to go on to another example. Well, I just wanted to mention, Bill, which I'm finding really interesting that, so I didn't answer when you sort of asked the first question, but because at first it feels silly, of course, yeah. but the more often you do it, the like you do actually start like that, that movement of your body affecting how you're feeling about it comes through, through like the repetition in really interesting it, it, ways. It has a, yeah. And of course, because we're doing it first time too, but if you think about choreography a little bit, right. I mean, you might think about it, you know, if you, if you think about stop in the name of love, we have the same kind of thing going on here in this play. So, um, yeah. So yeah, the self consciousness is, is a difficulty because for us, this is feels so artificial. Uh, right, but for them not so much. And what we're going to talk about when we get to restoration comedy is how artificial is it? Because we're going to talk a little bit about how the audience behaves uh, as well. Um, I want to look at one more here, uh, and this is um, uh, this is from Aaron Hill. So we're trying to keep an eye on the time here. Uh, who wrote an essay of uh, what's called an essay in the art of acting in 1746? Uh, and I'm using a different source book here called Actors on Acting. Um, the editors are Cole and Chinoy. And again, this is a collection of, of actors talking about how they do their work from across the centuries. Very useful source book. Um, so one of the things he's doing is talking about, uh, one of his examples is how to act anger. Uh, and he says, anger is pride provoked beyond regard of caution. It is a fierce and unrestrained effusion of reproach and insult. It must therefore, therefore be expressed impatiently by a fiery propensity in the eye, with a disturbed and threatening air, and with a voice strong, swift, and often interrupted by high swells of choking indignation. And then he goes and cites a passage from Shakespeare to tell you how to do it, and it's this passage. Now imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, sin summon up the blood, lend fierce and dreadful aspect to the eye, set the teeth close and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to its full height. And he says, uh, Hill says, impossible to draw a picture of anger more naturally or an instruction more complete and clear for expressing it. So we're going to do it. And again, following Hill's, ins Hill's instructions. First, the sinews being braced strong through all the joints, of the joints of the body, the look as a consequence is stumbled up. So stand. Um, uh, oh, sorry. The source of this quote is from Aaron Hill's. Uh, and it's, uh, again, I will, I will certainly put this in, in the chat afterwards. But it's from his... Uh, an Essay in the Art of Acting, uh, published first in 1746. Uh, and so and then he gives us de deliberate instructions following Shakespeare. So we're going to follow his instructions. The sinews being braced on. So stand and, and brace. So tighten up all your sinews. So just, just basically tension. And as soon as you tense, as soon as everything's tense, you are starting to feel already the spirit of anger a little bit. 
aren't we? Um, now the look becomes adapted and adhered by the fire that flashes from the eye. So now we look strongly forward and tense. And our eyes are wide and staring. Thirdly, the setting of the teeth and the wide expansion of the, no na of the nas nostrils follow naturally, becoming inseparable from an enraged bent of the eyebrow. So we think about that again, that tension, our nostrils wide, our teeth set. So really like clench those teeth and open your lips. Okay. And finally, uh, the breath being held hard is interrupted or restrained by the tumultuous preci precipitation of the spirits. So we tense, we breathe in, we, gr we grit our teeth and we open our eyes and nostrils. Great, thank you. Uh, this is anger according to Restoration Theater. Uh, so, uh, any thoughts about that? Does it say anything about the hands? Because when I was tensing, I immediately made fists. Is that yeah, part it, of it? Yeah. It doesn't actually in this particular passage say something about the hands, but it is a natural thing to do. It's a bit like what, what he says about when you, when you put the eyes, I found myself doing the eyes, I was already... <sighs> My nostrils are already flaring. So yeah, when you tense your body, the, 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 the clenching of a fist is an almost uh, inevitable one. So now we've all learned to be angry like a restoration tiger, uh, uh, as a, according to Aaron Hill. But what I'm getting at here is, A, that's highly artificial, but when you did it, did you not feel anger to a certain extent? Yeah, once we summon up those, those physiological uh, um, cues, which we're all familiar with, even though we're not, I hope, at this point, angry, uh, perhaps you're getting that way, and I apologize for what I'm making you go through. Uh, but um, y y what we do is we feel it, and then hopefully we can relax and let it go afterwards by, uh, you know, by taking away that tension. And, and yeah, it's like smiling makes one feel happy, or laughing, and so on. So these things actually physically affect us, and they affect the audience, right? And so it really does work in the way, and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly seeing in the chat precisely that, and I would agree. Uh, with all of that. And so it's fascinating to think about these, in some ways, ridiculous rules, <laughs> uh, but yet that they also are applicable, right? And they, they do function in the way it's, uh, the very way, you know, that Aaron Hill describes them in 1746. It makes us think back to, um, you know, Hamlet's advice to the actors. And so this, of course, anger typically would be more appropriate in a tragedy, actually, than a comedy, but it's not that you don't have it in comedy either. But there's a precise way of doing things. Well, they would say, here is the modesty of nature. Anger is this, but not that. It has these four qualities. You must have them all. If you don't have them all, you're not properly angry. Um, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, just sort of trying to see how long. I have no idea how long this will take, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, well, it, it might be more exaggerated in comedy, but in comedy, it actually might also be more restrained, uh, ironically enough. Uh, because a lot of comedy, especially restoration comedy, is about not letting the surface be disturbed, right? It's a lot about hiding things, right? So anger might be expressed instead in a bow, like, which is like, I can hate you, but it's great to see you, you know? And so a lot of it might be expressed sort of more in your style, because actually to break style would be to fail in a restoration comedy. So when we look at, at um, Way the World, for example, Fainall, what is one of his greatest failures in the play is when he grabs Marwood. Uh, and it's a failure because it's a complete breaking of style and worse, an actual physical grabbing and touching. Um, no rake worth his salt should have to um, descend to that. Yeah, and obviously uh, there's no, and thank you, kid, there's no simple rule to say it's never, for sure. Yeah, and in some instances it would be there. And as I suggest with Fainall, his anger there would, would burst out in that moment, his style would, 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 would desert him. And when it deserts him, as I say, as a rake, he loses credibility. Uh, the, the people of the period uh, would be more concerned with his loss of style than his physical assault, uh, which is maybe not uh, you know, uh, what, what we would like to see, but certainly would be accurate to how the, the, the plays at the time uh, would have been judged. So uh, again, these things are clearly excessive, performative, decorative, but they're also felt and precise and in the terms of its users, uh, natural. Uh, now I just wanna take a little sideways step uh, and, and speak a little bit about style and the audience. Because one of the ways I think this style is so natural for the restoration 
is that it is precisely the same kind of style that is happening off stage. So if we look, uh, and these are all different sources I'm using, um, um, but, but the first uh, couple are from uh, Peep's diaries. Um, uh, so uh, uh, he describes uh, one night um, that on, on, on this occasion, um, the, these people aren't in the same boxes that people were talking about, the audience members. And there's a rumor that the lady Castlemaine has fallen into disfavor. Thereupon, the lady does something that makes the audience hold its breath. And here's the quote. Leaning over other ladies a while to whisper with the king, she rose out of the box and went to the king's right hand between the king, between the king and the Duke of York, of York, which put the king himself as well as everybody else out of countenance. She did it only to show the world that she is not out of favor yet, as was believed. So the very preciseness of that. And another one which I particularly like here, uh, when she started, um, uh, I went to the king's house, to the maid's tragedy, but vexed all the while with two talking ladies and Sir Charles Sedley, yet pleased to hear their discourse. He being a stranger, and one of the ladies would and did sit with her mask on all the play, and being exceedingly witty, as ever I heard a woman, did talk most pleasantly with them, but was, I believe, a virtuous woman and of quality. He would fain know who she was, but she would not tell, yet did give him many pleasant hints of her knowledge of him, by that means setting his brains at work to find out who she was, and did give him leave to use all means to find out to find out who she was by pulling off her mask. He was mighty witty, and she also making sport of him very inoffensively. Did a more pleasant raconte I never heard. By that means, lost the pleasure of the play wholly. Um, so the the playing that's happening in the audience is, is particularly strong. Um, I'm going to quote this one, but just just as I'm listing a little bit of the number of mistresses um, amongst the cast. Uh, and the 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 the, uh, um, the, the people who, for whose mistresses they are in the audience. Um, so Jane Long, mistress of. Uh, sorry, um, Natalie, what was that question again? Do you want to just go ahead and ask it? I'm just. So it's sometimes hard to keep up with the uh, an Italia. Sorry, uh, with the chat. Uh, okay, um, I uh, might have misunderstood you, but I think you said that in Restoration Theatre, emotions are expressed um, outside outwardly with gestures, but at the same time you said that in comedy, uh, emotions are rather hidden uh, than exaggerated. I, I just... It seems like a contradiction, it, 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 a lot about it has a, it's about balance, but yeah, in tragedy, one can fully commit to um, the, outward, the outward expression of those emotions as dictated to by the, uh, um, by the particular suggestions of, uh, uh, of people like Hill and, and Betterton. In other words, part of the oratorical practice, in order to express anger, this is how one, in order to express sorrow and so on. Um, so we want to talk, I wanted to use that to talk about how precise people are in their application of gesture and that how precise the control of the actors. Uh, but then there is a shift over to what happens in restoration comedy, and I'm sort of trying to get it through talking at the audience a bit, um, is that their ability to express these things becomes limited by the, the necessary presenting of self as a complete facade, a whole, uh, one that has credibility and stature by holding on to that whole. And that it would break, as it does break, and then one could use the, the emotions the way we're talking. But most of the time it would be expressed, now the same thing, how do you put anger into your bow? Or how do you put gratitude? Or how do you put, so how do you then put, a, in other words, when we talk about the mask that this lady was wearing, the actors too are wearing masks. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, the answer is for certainly, um, to a certain extent, true. And it, it all depends on, um, whom it would be. Um, so in certain instances, in this play, for example, in The Way of the World, we see Foible impersonating uh, her, her mistress. So we see that a poorly executed attempt and the difference between that poorly executed attempt and, and her own. But, but depending, like a certain, you know, a certain level of waiter or maid who is particularly a lady in waiting uh, might be you know, more stylistically capable than the person they're waiting upon. Right. It's also complicated by the fact, as I'm just going to do this list of mistresses, uh, Jane Long, Mr. of Courtier George Porter, Susanna Hill, mistress of wealthy Sir Robert Howard, Betty Hall, mistress of Sir Philip Howard, Mrs. Johnson, mistress of Henry, Earl of Peterborough, Elizabeth Berry, mistress of John, Earl of Rochester, Peg Hughes, mistress of Prince Hubert, and those two famous luminaries, Maul Davis and Nell Gwynne, kept by His Majesty the King. 
And the other thing that would happen in the, in the restoration stage is there was no sort of common source of costume. Uh, so people would wear sort of costumes as they had them. Now, leading actresses might have the best costume, but actually the person playing the maid might have a nicer dress than the person playing Lady Wishford because she's got a, a mistress that has showered her, uh, you know, her partner has showered her with more gifts. And so there are these things that are at play in the play is that what is part of the signification in the play and what is in, in, in that interaction between the audience and the stage uh, that is also um, going on. And finally, uh, and uh, I'm just going to, this is the last passage I'll read in this section. Um, I'm just going to read uh, here from, um, about the, the, about Kiniston uh, and his encounter with uh, Sir um, Charles Sedley. Just, and maybe you are aware of this, but if you're not, it's kind of quite fun. Um, there was another handsome man, Sir Charles Sedley, whose style of dress the young actor aped. And his presumption was punished by a ruffian hired by the baronet who accosted Kiniston in St. Charles Park as Sir Charles and thrashed him in that character. The actor then mimicked Sir Charles on the stage. A consequence was that on the 30th of January, 1669, Kiniston was waylaid by three or more four asylums and so clubbed by them that there was no play on the following evening and the victim, mightily bruised, was forced to keep to bed. Uh, so I want to point out here that the interesting closeness of style on stage and style off stage. And so we might ask ourselves at this point, who is aping whose style? Is the style coming from the stage to the audience or from the audience to the stage, or is it going back and forth, right? It's certainly in, in, in modern dress or who is learning from whom and who is performing for whom. Uh, there are all of these sort of levels of performance. And when we talk about naturalism, we might say, well, they are aping the style of those people who are watching. So that's surely natural. They're naturally aping the artificiality of their audience. So the artifice of that goes back and forth in a really kind of interesting way. Um, I would say also it's supported by what we, what we know of the physical layout of the stage, that most of the acting area was on the apron in front of the proscenium arch. Um, so a wide open acting area that focused attention on the actor, but also kept them literally closer to the audience and didn't have them in, in front of scenery. There wasn't a lot of realistic scenery at the time anyway. Uh, and finally, all, of course, the habit of the audience to pay to sit on that stage, to sit on that apron, uh, and often for the male actors to be outshone uh, by the, the, you know, the fops sitting on stage in much nicer clothes than they could possibly own. And also the fact that we know uh, we've got accounts of people walking right through the stage during the action to go see their mistresses in their dressing rooms um, during the performance. So all of those things sort of suggest that this play continues sort of off the stage and into the audience. But also suggests, I think, that there's a closeness of, of uh, naturalism um, in this style. That in fact, in many ways, though it's, it's far less uh, expressive in some ways than what we've had in tragic theater, uh, it mimics very closely what the audience is doing. So how is that not natural? Except for the fact that nobody in the audience is acting naturally at all, <laughs> you know, or, or are they, right? And so we have to ask uh, um, that question uh, as well. Uh, and of course, all of this is partly instigated by the taste of the court as they return from France. And they want this kind of different kind of theater with this intrigue, with this, um, these kinds of characters. Um, and then we also see that, 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 uh, that the audience is composed, the audience composition and what the plays are about are very close early in the restoration. And so, as we know, restoration comedy is, is more, uh, more licentious early, uh, less likely to have a moral ending of any kind. In fact, style wins, screw the rest, is sort of the early restoration. Whereas when we move farther, you know, forward and we get to Congress' way of the world, he's now at a place where the audience is broadening. Um, so one of our questions here is what happens when morality interacts with and intrudes on style? Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. And I think the reason I chose the, the, the marriage scene uh, is that that negotiation that happens in that scene um, uh, is, I think, about how morality and style can coexist. Right? So... Um, I'm just looking at the time and I'm realizing, wow, it's going fast. <laughs> so I'm going to skip ahead perhaps a little bit. Um, but rather than read it, um, I'll, I'll um, suggest to you that in the dedication to the play, in the Congreve's dedication to the way of the world, uh, he has a whole section in regards to characters, that they're so foolish that they're all, I'm not presenting anybody that's true in any way. This is exaggerated. Um, and then in the end of his prologue, which I think notably is, is, is spoken by the actor Betterton, uh, he says to them, 
Uh, so it, it's interesting that sort of, and Betterton sort of makes fun of the playwright at, at earlier on too. So the layers of, of the playwright through Betterton making fun of himself is kind of fun to think about for a moment. Uh, but that this would also be spoken before the audience. Satire, he thinks you ought not to expect. For so reformed a town, who dares correct? To please this time has been his sole pretense. He'll not instruct, lest it should give offense. Should he by chance a knave or fool expose? That hurts none here, sure there are none of those. In short, our play shall, uh, with your leave to show it, give you one instance I have a passive poet who to your judgments yields all resignation. So save her down after your own discretion. Um, and I think what's, what a lovely layered piece of style and spoken by Bettertune who's playing the very aptly named Fain All. And I think that Fain All at this point is a good way to think also of what Congreve is doing, who actually is giving instruction and clearly is satirizing, but trying to find a way to get the audience on side with it, right? To think about how can we work our way through this to, to keep what we like of style and yet figure out a way to be somewhat moral uh, at the end too. Um, I'll also mention, as I said, the costume reflects its, its audience, but it also restricts them. So women uh, uh, are wearing skirts, big voluminous skirts, such to extent if you ever have to sit in a, in a restoration skirt, you can only put like one half of one cheek on a quarter of the chair. Uh, otherwise, the skirt will go crazy. So that's the only way for a woman to sit in the restoration. Um, no other way if you're a high class. Um, the, uh, the, the corsets are, can be so restrictive of breath uh, that at most you've got about one quarter of your lung capacity. Um, which means, you know, you're not moving particularly fast. Uh, of course, high heels, uh, lace, I mean, all of these things that restrict the wigs, all of these things you have to be very careful in how you move or you'll look ridiculous. So women's movement, as I suggested, is highly controlled. But within that sphere, what can men women um, do in the restoration? What can they do with style? Uh, there, we're going to look at fans in particular. Men, uh, uh, of course, uh, have hose as I suggested before, to display themselves. Um, they also have heels, so there is some limitations or some elevation of their movement. Um, sleeves, handkerchiefs, wigs, and sometimes swords. So certainly more able to move freely. Uh, but the one I want to sort of talk about a little bit for men um, is, as I'm now here, we're just going to get up hopefully and do some of these. Uh, and, and that is to say, and I'm going to get, get a handkerchief too. So you could have a handkerchief, but also men of the period would have cuffs Often it would come about, they could come like up to six inches past your fingertips. So you wouldn't need a handkerchief, you could just use your cuffs. Now, one of the things about that is you could sort of tell a fop because they would have cuffs that are just too long. Their hands would essentially become useless. Um, in this play, Sir Wilful Whitwood, Whitwood would have a cuff that is too short. It would be unfashionable. Whereas Mirabelle and Fainall, would, their cuffs would be Goldilocks. They would be just right. Uh, enough to allow a flourish, but able still to wield. So if we just use a, a handkerchief, and since you have, have a handkerchief, just think of your hand. A little bit like what we did in the bow. Uh, but, or if you have something, you just flip it. And as we flip it, we just, yes. So if we had a cuff, we could do that too. Oh, yes, I agree. Or I really agree. Uh, the more times we do it, the more likely we'll be a fall. Is we lift it up and we have fun and we start and our, you can even feel your toes started to go up as your heels and your yeah and we get to be more and then of course there's also gathering it in and what one does with those so all of the ways in which uh, uh, those uh, can feel and also note that there is quick and slow so there's versus so one is the, one the flourish and just the feel of that the difference and also by the way note that how close these are to Fencing. So that they're, though they are um, flourishes and they seem ridiculous, they're also close to danger in an interesting way, at least certainly for the rake. Uh, again, for the fop, it's usually a failed attempt. And that's why the more they do it, the more excessive, uh, the more uh, ridiculous. Um, right. Uh, so I was uh, planning to talk about that, but I'm just thinking time wise, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, um, and so I want to keep keep standing up. I just want to mention. I'm not going to. I'm just going to quickly ask. How familiar are you with the scene that we're talking about? So um, should I read parts of it, or do we are, are we fairly confident that we could skip to to to, to moments? I'm going to go with that. I'm seeing fairly confident. 
Skip. Great. Um, so, um, so if we look at, at, at what I was talking about before, um, and we talk about imprimis. Thank you, imprimis. Uh, thank you, imprimis. So go ahead and just try uh, the different ways in which you could say thank you now, and then ask yourself: Do you think a, a handkerchief or a flourish with the wrist is better than a bow here, or is it is a combination of both? Right? And so, again, the feeling that's created and the communication that happens is going to be different depending on which you choose uh, to do. If we look later in the speech, uh, and this is about halfway through, um, now that he, it's after, uh, probably not later in the speech, just earlier in the speech, uh, it's right after she's finished all of her proposals. And he says, um, uh, when you are dwindled into a wife, that I may not be beyond measure enlarged into a husband. And so I think that last enlarged into a husband, is it one? Is it, I'm mean, going to be enlarged into a husband. So what pleasure is there? Where does it go for you and what can it happen? And, or is it about to it or enlarged into a husband? And now I will start. So maybe that's where the bow is, not on thank you. So again, note that these things are some of the joy and the pleasure uh, that we have, but also how... Uh, uh, and, they move. and finally, the last one that I was going to suggest was those provisos admitted in other things I may prove. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm holding it with two fingers. Um, and if, without a handkerchief, you can just you can also just think, just feel it's, it's all about flicking that wrist. So two fingers or one finger in your thumb? Two, two, two. No, it's between those two fingers. Okay. Okay, and again, as I said, sometimes you wouldn't need even to hold it because you'd have cuffs that could do that. Um, that's one of the reasons that makes for fops fops is their cuffs are so long that they can, whatever they move their hand, it's this flurry of, right? Um, and and it's it part of what sort of conveys immediately who they are. Um, so this, the last one is, those provisors admitted in other things I may prove attractable and complying husband. So those provisors admitted, and I think this one, I would go with, those, I may prove attractable and complying husband, right? And, and that is sort of the end flourish to say, this is what I shall do, but I'm not gonna do it by, by completely bowing down. I will keep my stone out. Uh, and so there is an agreement made. And I suggest now if we go to Kerr, and I know I've sort of done it um, uh, backwards, but I think I did it backwards because the fan is more fun than the, uh, uh, than the handkerchief, but also easier for you to do the handkerchief. So I didn't want to go to, you know, didn't want the, uh, have to follow the fan with the handkerchief. Um, but what the woman gets to do, and I just want to suggest some of the different ways. There's dangling the fan. You can just use your handkerchief or a pencil or something. Just, just dangle it. And, and there's this fascinating flirtation that one does with the dangle. Uh, and then if we just uh, wrap it around and hold it. And again, note how, yeah, flourish of that, right? right? It's, a little, it's a little bit hip hop, a little bit, you know, it's, it's an interesting flourish that one does uh, with that. Um, there's also, of course, pointing. It's a particularly powerful thing to do, right? right? And, and it gives you a lot of an interesting power. So she can make any of her points. I will not be called names. Right? So if we look at uh, earlier in her speech, um, we might say, I won't be called names, which is sort of how she begins her negotiations. I won't be called names. Right? So if she starts there, or if she goes, I won't be called names, right? And how the, the pattern. Uh, they could very well do it. Yes, they absolutely would use the audience in prologues and epilogues. No question about it. Yeah, direct address, absolutely. Um, then, of course, there's the exciting, and we haven't even got into opening the fan. Opening and closing. I won't be called names or even opening and turning. Right? So often, so if you think about it, your hand would be sort of backwards to yourself. And if you make your hand the fan, right? And then of course, note the difference between this, the fan as shield, and this. With slight covering flirtation. And so all of those different uses of the fan, um, as I said, the moving up and down and now the cl closing, um, uh, <laughs> it is good to see lots of fans, absolutely. Um, 
But also, there is, again, I don't have the text with me. Uh, I was looking for it, but I failed to find the references before. There is also a categorization of all of these movements of the fan. The, you know, like the thousand and one ways you can use a fan in restoration comedy. Um, so I've just given you a few, but I just think it, it is, there's so much fun, but they also feel. And then, of course, you know, all the things. I think if you have a fan, I'm just looking at Natalia with the fan there, it immediately makes you feel playful. Right? It makes you feel immediately, what will I do here? Yeah. And of course, puts you in that. It also, it's interesting because it makes you feel artificial, right? But also perfectly natural, right? But it, the joy of it. Oh, and, and move on. So she has, like, like, uh, uh, like he would with the fan. And I think a fan is way better than a handkerchief. I was always, I've always been uh, jealous of the fan uh, and, and never having had a chance to use one uh, on stage. Uh, but, but all of those. And so if we think about those with, I won't be called names, or I may by degrees, I may by degrees dwindle into a wife, right? right? Or, or finally at the end, uh, she's her, she says in his response, or pardon me, his last thing is about becoming a husband. And she says, oh, horrid provisos. So if you think about oh, horrid provisos, if we do horrid provisos like, oh, horrid provisos, or if we do it like, Oh, horror provides us. Uh, the, the, the real difference here is how does she accept that? So is her oh, horror provides us? Going back to what you were saying earlier, Katie, what does it mean? Is, is, it, is it honestly horror provides us? Or do we, with our gesture, make it be the exact opposite? Um, and so what I'm suggesting here uh, is that this is the moment in the play which is trying to find a way to marry morality and style. Uh, it's trying to find a way to allow... Um, uh, Milliment and uh, uh, pardon me, yes, Milliment and Mirabelle to have like a rake, a rake's wedding, if, if it can be said that way. So that we 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 like them as much as the, the traditional heroes. They still have all of that, but also it's it's now acceptable. And what we can notice in the play that Sir uh, Sir Wilful Whitwood and Lady Wishfort are both sort of honest simpletons, the kind of people who get discarded and chewed up in much restoration. Here they're taken advantage of, but they are not punished. At the end, they are taken care of. And that's very particular about that change and that change so that, and they're taken care of by those people that have style. And as I suggested to you earlier, um, I think that um, the punishment of Thanol uh, at the rake who is un, uh, unreformed, but also, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, yes, I'm sure there must be some good ones. The punishment of, uh, of Thanol because he fails at style and morality. Both of those things uh, are together, right? And that's why he, he needs to be so particularly punished. So in other words, um, we've now got a balance of style. Uh, it, it's critical, but style alone is no longer sufficient to be the hero. Yet it's still so damn attractive, as I see in your desire to all buy fans. Uh, yeah, it's exactly what, uh, what the, there's a great pleasure in it. Um, so the play suggests, or I'm just skipping a bit, but um, that uh, what I'm suggesting about Fainall in his grab, he becomes like Sir Philip, or Sir Charles Sedley on stage, um, someone who should be mocked because he's resorted to physical violence, uh, deserving of it. He's also morally incorrect and deserving of it too. And those two things are coming together. So Mirabelle and Melamont, on the other, other hand, maintain style, but it's a sort of, if I'm going to call it, a sort of style to the core. Uh, style as substance, a gesture that goes beneath the skin. So the natural state and it's sold to the audience is balanced. So in other words, I can have those things. Uh, I want your face to be natural. I don't want my child to be strangled in a corset and so on, uh, squeezed like a loaf. Um, so there's a balance of accepting those things, but also maintaining style. And finally, I'm just going to end uh, with this and maybe open it up to some discussion. And sorry, this took a little longer than I expected. Um, how different is it for us? Uh, there's all sorts of books on theater semiotics. Uh, um, Artaud calls for the thousand and one gestures that signify. Uh, how, how is that not close to chirologia and chironomia? Uh, to what extent are we doing these things? Are we always uh, performing and finding a balance between the kind of gestures we make uh, and how we're being judged? In fact, being judged by our performance of self constantly. And 
creating our performance of self. And I, I was going to say it's extremely clear in this medium as we're always watching ourselves be watched by others. So I think that the one thing I can say where Zoom takes us closer to the restoration uh, is in that awareness. Okay, I'm going to stop there uh, and open it up uh, to comments, questions, discussion. Uh, and sorry for sort of zipping along at the end there. Uh, and I will sort of, uh, oh, uh, thank you. I, I hope that was fun. <laughs> uh, I certainly enjoyed doing it. Uh, again, I think it's a lot of fun for students. Um, if you if you take that when you're talking about these passages and you put some of those things into practice, uh, I think you'll get you'll get them very engaged. They will feel silly at first, uh, for sure. Uh, but I think they can take that. Uh, good. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that. So, are there any thoughts or questions or anything anybody wants to ask at this point? Uh, Diana. Thank you, Bill. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. It's it's wonderful to have you know, shared movement uh, over Zoom. Um, this is kind of a <laughs> a little bit of an off the wall question, but since we're talking about the way of the world, um, in addition to you know these great movements of fans, etc., um, there's a lot of um, burping and hiccuping and even the implication of farting in the play, um, particularly around the character of Petulant. <laughs> I I would I'm dying to know, you know, how that, you know, would these be also stylized? Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> that's a great question. I think not. Um, and I'll sort of sort of confess that I first um, began restoration, uh, my interest in restoration comedy by performing in it in Way of the World. That was the first time I was exposed. That's why it's, it's close to me. Uh, of course, I got to be Sir Wilford Whitwood, which I don't know what that says about me, but uh, I'll try not to take that as an insult. Um, but in, in fact, I think one of the fun things is a little bit like, you know, um, Swift's poem, Celia. I think in, in, in a way that the restoration is all surface, but underneath there's, there's the bodily functions. So I think those, particularly again, who those are done by and in front of, um, they expose people. Um, and uh, uh, so I think, yeah, I don't think they'd be stylized particularly. Although, having said that, as with everything in this period, yeah, there probably would be a manual on, if you want to have an effective burp, burp this way. If you want to make it a really effective fart, distend the belly, you know, uh, breathe in, distend the belly, you know, uh, crouch down, you know, all of these things. There would definitely be somewhere some advice. And, I think what we what we do know about the period, and we know this coming from the Shakespearean period too, is that all the actors would have their lines of business. So the same sort of actor would do these things in play after play. So the same kind of actor would play the fops and, and, and play the drunkards and so on. And, and so they would be expert uh, at, you know, <laughs> at their bodily functions, uh, as I hope we all are, frankly. But uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, that's, I hadn't actually thought of that before particularly. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely, it would be part of the part of it. And I think that's part of again when we think about restoration comedy, we think of it as so highly stylized and artificial. But I think it's actually really close to its audience. So it's strangely naturalistic, in, in, in the, even in the modern sense, uh, though it feels like it couldn't possibly be. Um, yeah, Thank and of course, it's source of pleasure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anyone else? Um, uh, anything you want to say, comment on, ask about, or uh, we can always, uh, I can just put stuff in the chat at this point. I know it's the end of a long day too for everybody, so. I asked a question um, a while ago. I feel like it got lost in the chat. Oh, I was curious. Oh yeah, no, there's so many things. I was curious about, um, Angelica in the rover. Um, this was kind of right after we were talking about uh, like being tense uh, when you're angry. Because the thing is, is she is like very, very angry with Wilmer, but it's more complicated because she's also really, really upset. And then, like you said, they like, you know, the female characters, because they're wearing these like restricting outfits, she's also restricted in that way. So I was kind of curious how that would play out. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, and I think the rover is a really interesting case. Because the rover we would call restoration comedy, but of course it's also much more than that. I mean, it comes under that category. Um, but to, to, to label it as a comedy only would be incorrect. And so this is where that when the acting style comes in, I think it would be a real mix. Um, and so that we would have to draw on some of those tragic forms uh, as well more often. Um, but particularly, what you what you're, you're absolutely right about Angelica too is that 
she would have lots of range of, of feelings and emotions, but they would have to be restricted. Um, they're literally restricted by physically what she's wearing. Um, it, it would literally be impossible for her to run across the stage or even jog, uh, you know, or even walk that fast, really, without without losing style or potentially falling. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yes, and yes, and yes, to tell you, it would be immensely disruptive for people to walk across the stage, but they did it, right? And so that's what we know uh, about the time. We know about the time. We sort of know about the fact that like, when Garrick took over theater in the 18th century, one of his acts finally was after a whole century to ban audience from the stage. Um, and it took that long. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, Katie. I was just following up on what you and Ariel were talking about. So when you said people are wearing corsets with like a quarter of the lung capacity, that's the actresses too, not just the audience? Yeah, I mean, I think that the actresses probably wouldn't, right? It would be, it would be okay. a kind of self-sabotage to do that. But, that's what but, I was thinking. But, but what they would, because especially when you think about, you know, part of their job is to breathe in and use that breath to support projection for the theater. But they would have to act as though they had, right, in order to, in order to um, convey the right um, characteristics of, uh, of a woman of the time and in that kind of costume. So what I mean by that is if they suddenly were able to run, it would, it would break the stylistic illusion. So yes, absolutely. It would be, I, you know, we don't have necessary proof of it, but I think it would be ridiculous uh, for an actor to uh, completely wear a corset. However, they wear a corset to a certain extent. It's amazing. And, um, um, and certainly I, I tried one on just to feel, see what it would feel like, but it's amazing what a corset does to your, the way of moving and your posture. It completely sort of, and we talk about the artificial, the, the corset is like a, well, uh, here I am fancy. And here I am, uh, completely uh, straight as I normally am not. And therefore, here's how I will, you know, when I turn, I'm more likely to turn like this than turn my head a little bit. And so those things become, yes. And so that we become sort of, um, immediately our costumes actually connote a kind of style to us. And so uh, that, so they would, I would suggest the actresses would, would tighten them enough to get the feeling and the effect of a corset. But I think, and certainly when I've done a play, again, this is a modern doing of the play, but, Nobody would wear the course it's that tight, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you got to support your breath and you got to fill a theater. This is very specific. But I'm still on the rover. So we're dressed in for masquerade and Helena, at least at one point, is dressed as a as a gypsy or a boy. They have been changing the conventions of their bodily carriage to match what they were wearing or. Yes, yes absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, breeches parts um, are a particular category of the restoration. And so um, when we talk about breeches parts, I mean, the women first get on stage in the restoration and it's not like this is a great movement forward in women's rights. It's because the king and all those other men wanted to see women on stage. They wanted to gaze at them. Um, and particularly, they liked breeches parts, the parts where women dressed as men so they could look at their legs because otherwise legs were always covered by skirts. So it was an opportunity for the men in the audience to oval the legs of the uh, actors. No, in a way, so I, I'm always a uh, chicken and the egg wondering sometimes if, the, if that male bow and gesture to point at the leg maybe began with women who were saying, have a look at my leg, and then was then copied um, by, this, by the, the, the gallants of the period, uh, or if it was the other way around. And, but one of the interesting things then is it also invites the gaze upon the men, which is a fascinating sort of doubleness that's happening. But yeah, I think there would be a fun thing where the, the female actor would ape, and maybe really well, or maybe with a deliberate, um, uh, a deliberate sort of falsity, the, the male actions. Uh, <laughs> and then the one sort of, the, the, the pants were you, the, often they're sort of like, if you think of kind of a Capri uh, style pant with a, with a bright, bright stocking below it would be sort of, would, would be often the sort of the, 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 the period. So we're past doublet and hose. It's not quite that, you know, that belongs to an earlier, uh, an earlier period at this point. Uh, good. So anything else or, or should we wrap it up here? And if so, I'll, I'll take a moment. Um, did people, I know people want, I'm trying to remember what sources I promised, uh, to put in the chat. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and do that, uh, now, unless there are other questions or maybe I can, I can type as questions are being asked too, if you want. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. It's a tremendous amount of fun and a great way to, to have a day evening. Uh, and all. Oh, great. Great. Yeah, that was sort of my, as I said at the beginning, if I could at least accomplish that, I feel like I'm 
I don't know what it feels like at this point in the day. Oh, we're losing your sound a bit as you type. For some reason, it seems to be linked to your typing. Oh, uh, I won't type then. The hell with typing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to share. So maybe we'll just keep talking. I'll type at the very end. and then. Yeah. I think we probably want to wrap it up. Right. Um, all right. Well, thank you all very much then. Yeah. Uh, do, you want, do you want to say anything, Aaron, uh, about tomorrow or anything? No. I, I mean, just thank you for doing this for us, for ending the day on uh, a very uh, pleasant note. And just, it's a great, yesterday at the end of the day, I was exhausted. Wonderfully so. But now I actually am a little energized and ready to, okay, ready to do wow. things. So this is, this is wonderful. Um, okay, and yes, great. Natalia, they were on stage in France and the continent before, before England. Sorry. Oh, I didn't even see that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yes, I will then uh, take a moment. Then I'm going to flip my, my uh, computer around. It's easier for me to type the other way. I've got it flipped around and I'll type those things in. And so otherwise you can carry on and, uh, and leave if you want, or it'll be there in a couple of minutes. All right. Thanks all very much. It was a great deal of fun. Bye.